I really appreciate the opportunity to come here. I, I had, we have a really great team working uh, like Mark Trotter from CQ University up in Rockhampton, Queensland, uh, Colin Tobin, who got his PhD with me, and Mill Thomas at Carter State. So for us, we have lots of different environment. Ours is but it's really extensive and big and dry, and it's hard to see things. And this is just, uh, that past view included most of what you could see in that view was in this pasture. And here's the tracking data of a couple cows and they go in different places and it's really even hard to find them. And we, this is just tracking data for a couple months. So it's, it's really difficult to find them. Um, it's difficult to monitor their health and well-being. And uh, if, we could, if we could monitor them remotely, reduce some labor and definitely improve animal welfare and probably improve in productivity. So how do we do it? And, it, and the answer I am argue is precision livestock management. And what is it? A um, couple definitions is continuous monitor all the factors that might influence animal productivity and welfare to develop a sustainable management strategies or a management system based on the continuous automatic real-time monitoring, control of production, reproduction, animal health, welfare, and environmental impacts of livestock production. So essentially using new technologies to do remote monitoring of livestock. And so we've done this, we've done this a lot and it's uh, people, I mean, there's more than this, but a lot of it is based on GPS tracking, accelerometers and thermistors. Uh, so those are some of the, the biggies that, that, are, that have been used. And accelerometers are really handy. Uh, some of Cameron's last work, I think, were, were accelerometers. They have monitored three axis. They're not very big, fit on an ear tag. And you can really see some real differences in behavior. This is some stuff for some use. Uh, and look at the, this is just the raw data from the three axes. So if they're standing, you don't see very much, and each color is a different axis. But when they're feeding, it's a very different, more variability. Even the contractions at lambing, a different pattern, walking, licking. And it's that variation of, of, the, of the movement that you can really find a lot of stuff and has definitely been the subject of a lot of machine learning and other types of research. But if you just visually look at the data and, and look at, and know what the behavior is, there's some real differences. And so it's, it's a real potential tool. And there's been a lot of things. I, I've been in a business, I've been tracking cows since 98 and we've tracked a lot of cattle. And from now, we're, we were really happy with that. And, and now as we transition from store on board accelerometers and tracking data into things like using LoRa and other techniques, satellite and other things, we're now getting excited and we want to go to real time. We're, we're never really happy, right? We, now we want to see everything in real time, but there's some real purposes for that. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of companies in the business, and this is just a partial movement, a partial set of some of these, like we're testing some movement, um, uh, the Digital Matters, Oyster 2, John Walker and the folks at Texas A&M have used that, we're starting to use that, Abbey Way, other low raw stuff, Cirrus, I keep hoping that Cirrus is gonna get their, their uh, technology out so we can go buy that and try that out. Uh, Munitor out of Israel, Herd Dog, an accelerometer based one that we've looked at and looked at the CQU and of course, and Munitor also has one. That's, and that's not even all, there's a, there's a big business, entrepreneurs are doing it, the time is now, real time tracking and monitoring is getting excited and lots of people are in it and there are lots of promises and the delivery of what the promises is, isn't always quite there. We're trying out this out on some of this um, movement, this is one of the older versions of the movement tag, it's a GPS based and low rail. So the idea is you have a GPS on a tag, it's solar powered, uh, it gets the GPS position and then every hour it transfers it to a, uh, a low raw gateway. And then, that, and then using either a, a router at, at a house or a headquarters homestead or using a cellular technology, you can transfer it to the internet and then you can get it and, and take a look at the, at the data. So, and if, with a little luck, you can kind of see, he gives all the positions, last positions of where your animals were. So it's, it's nice. 
a lot more we can do there like the low raw we're testing um the, the nice thing is they're they're commercially available you can buy them uh you can buy them for a little less like 15 a year or just buy them outright us dollars uh we've been testing it out we got about one to 16 positions a day on earlier versions now the thought is you can get probably get hopefully we can get 10 positions they're supposed to take them every hour but we they're kind of hoping that we can get 10 we're going to be checked we're checking them out now uh in arizona so hopefully we have some new data to check these ideas out but there's some real potential for that and so i want to just go some examples that our lab has used on a potential of using remote monitoring for animal welfare issues. And this, this was a study I got to do when I had a Fulbright in Australia with Mark Trotter at, at CQ University. We had some, they had some cattle that were out on another study, but they happened to get three-day sickness. And three-day sickness is a viral disease uh, with mosquitoes primary vectors. And it comes on with a big high fever, shivering, stiff, often may get lame, they, they quit eating, they get depressed. But if they're not stressed, usually it only lasts a few days. And that was the case in this study. So you get a chance to really see animals get really sick and not die, which is great. But it also gives a chance of just a real opportunistic study to see that because they, the cattle were wearing accelerometers, neck accelerometers. But check out what happened. So we have a couple heifers. This is the day before they got sick. And they, these two healthy animals, you can see some diurnal patterns of activity. At, during the grazing period, the heat of the day, probably come in and do some resting and an increase in activity in the evening. Um, this is in, in the next morning, it's a morning bout, this was in the evening. But the sick animals had a big drop right when they got sick. And this was the, the uh, herdsmen saw them at about uh, 11 o'clock in the morning. And so you could already see a big change in our normal behavior. Instead of being out eating in the morning, they were much less active and dropped way off their activity draped off just before they were diagnosed and so if we would have had an algorithm to look at that earlier and it make a flag probably could have detected these animals that they were getting sick um, before they actually were checked and this was in a small paddock uh right near CQ University. And so they, were, they checked regularly, but I don't think it's really tough to find these animals that are getting sick. And a, this big change in their diurnal pattern may be a real clue for that. So this kind of gave us an idea that there's the real potential to detect disease from accelerometers by a change from their normal activity patterns. Um, another one we looked at, and there's been several things, some of Mark's, in Mark Trotter's lab, they've done several work, doing some work in, um, New Zealand checking out using accelerometers to detect lambing. We did this in a pin study in New Mexico State. And one of the things I really like about this is that we had these are the three, we had three different things. One was the average of the X range, just the range of every 10 seconds, 10 second affix. And we were looking at the change in X range, that's the green line the change in the Y range, the, just the total range and in the standard deviation next week. And if you look at that just prior onset, there's a big change in behavior from normal activity right at lambing and for a few hours and it drops back off. It's an unusually high peak. We were able to use, it worked really well for detection, probably better than some of the other approaches where they have used accelerometers to predict behavior and then look at changes in predicted behaviors to detect lambing. And I think looking at the at the rock cell neurometer data or some version of that, some metric derived from the cell neurometer data may be more useful to detect changes in their diurnal patterns that might be associated with something like lambing or, or, or earlier with illness. Another thing is that, and um, out here in, in the western, southwestern US, water is the most critical nutrient. I mean, we, and it's if, if animals don't have um, uh, things we have, we got to really check regularly and frequently. It takes a large labor requirement, and water system is a big thing. So we check a look at that um, uh, chain, look at the difference in pattern. In a normal pattern, cattle go to water, get a drink, and then leave and rest, ruminate. If we did a simulated water failure, as if the thing did, 
animals go in the water and stay. So if you have real time tracking, you could be able to see that because the animals don't follow their normal pattern. They stick one in water trying to get a drink. And it was a queer thing. We got a good idea of that. So the distance from water is noticeably different. Uh, when we restricted the water, they stuck around and afterwards, after they entered the, the water lot where this water was located. So another potential for real thing using real time tracking or real time accelerometers is detection of predators. You know, it can be a big, big issue in the Western US. Uh, one Texas A&M uses, ch checks out uh, livestock guardian dogs, see if livestock guardian dogs are, are a big issue. They, this, they can use real time tracking to see if they're staying with the state in the pastures they're supposed to be. And it would really be nice if you had real time tracking the sheep and goats to see where the livestock guardian dogs were with relation to the flock they're supposed to be gardening because they're not going to be able to do as good a job guarding probably if they're not nearby. So the tracking of the livestock guardian dogs is, is some exciting stuff. And so it has some real potential for that to see how well they're working. And you may be able to see some things, uh, work done with wolves. There's some real differences and changes in spatial movements when the predators are veiled. So we might be able to do that with both tracking data, also maybe in activity patterns of the livestock and the guardian dogs, maybe prep be able to detect the presence of predators. And so that the managers may be able to do something to perhaps uh, protect the livestock and, and reduce predation events. Uh, Another important thing that's not animal welfare thing, but in the US, and especially on public lands, there's a lot of concern, just like in New Zealand, is, is livestock impacts on riparian areas, and they can occur quickly. It's often, you know, with labor stuff, it's hard to check often enough. And it, there's some real differences. I can just, just check it like this. I mean, it happens. Here's just a, like some, a day of, of tracking data in uh, Northern California, where we track some cows, some cows near the stream, other. And so we, we're trying to check out the idea. We're hoping we think there's a lot of potential to use GPS tracking and to see to what extent livestock are impacting the riparian areas. It's pretty easy to uh, monitor those. We know these from GIS where the streams are. We can put buffers on it and perhaps the amount of use, essentially the points near the stream may be an idea of where there's going to be a problem. And if there is in the U.S., uh, we often required to move livestock out of a pasture and out of the riparian zone once the stubble height gets down to uh, a, a low amount, uh, typically four inches, um, something like 10 centimeters or something we got, you have to move them, even though the up ones may not be used at all. And the whole thing is because the riparian zones and the stream banks are just so, so things. And the other thing is you may be able to do the same thing, talking about concentration of nutrients. Um, by GPS things, we may be able to find out places where livestock camp, where the spots, and so we can get ideas where nutrients are being relocated and redistributed uh, through the normal grazing and spatial movements. Another example of using the ideas of this is to uh, use social interactions, uh, maybe how the cows interact with each other. So we did a study in Arizona where we, we counted the, the time that 75 meters we of the cows were with, within each other. We did a spatial associations and distance was about 500 meters apart. And so we did it at, uh, we excluded the areas around water. And so we were thinking about spatial associations, maybe as the, as the forage resource gets depleted and the animals start grazing, they'll move further apart and quit being so close together, less spatial associations. As they begin to wander apart and the search of forage might be an indicator it'd be time to move. So we did this with uh, two different pastures at Arizona. Uh, one was three times the size of the other, and this is just a case study, but it's, it's really interesting. We tracked about a third of the cows, and it's one of the largest ones that, that we knew of about in, in the U.S. We tracked a large number of the cattle, 35 in each pasture, one a a larger pasture, lower stocking density, one three times smaller, three times the stocking density. And we tracked them for the same time uh, in the summer, June 6th, July 16th. And the association, which is measured at, at 75 meters, um, the, the time that they spent with each other, and this, this Y axis indicates the percentage, so like uh, about, 
two and a half to three and a half percent of the the cows spent with of their total positions away from water were next to the same cow. And that that association declined during the six week study. So essentially indicating perhaps that the animals were moving willing to move further apart as the forage became depleted. And so that we think there might be a potential we've got to do a lot more work on it, but it's, it was interesting that social associations may have some other ways and we can be able to monitor them if we had real time tracking in real time. One of the things that's, that I just think we want to do is that, that people tend to have, I think that there's a concept of cow buddies, or I guess you'd say cows have mates. I think it's really overrated. In our study, cows spent less, less than 10% of their time within 75 meters of any tracked cows. Or, you know, ex excluding time near water. And the most associated two cows were 789 meters apart in the, in the lower stocking density and uh, 1,049 meters apart in the smaller pasture. So they just did not spend, they like to be with other animals, but they don't have, seem to have mates. They just don't have buddies. Uh, last thing, hopefully to go to, kind of on like follow up on camera. We think there's different kinds of cattle adaption and variation. And I think there's a load of variation within breeds. We have some and we're interested in hill climbers and here's some hill climbers versus some more bottom dwellers. There's a lot of variation in among cows. Here's some tracking pattern of a large ranch in, in North Central Nevada. And look at the different patterns of these. This, there's only a three cows out of 2,000, but there's a lot of variation. And I just picked these out to be things that's cows graze in different areas. This one with the more green hanging on the streams, others moving around, others using high things. So we are really interested in this variability. And a question, like here's another example from our work in Montana. Cow on the left is definitely a hill climber. The other one's a bottom dweller. One bottom dweller may be a problem. The patterns we saw persisted even when we separated them. So we think there's some real potential for selection for that. We did a couple different studies. Our first study uh, we published in 2015, we looked at five ranches, 87 cattle, and we looked at SNPs. Remember SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms. The second study, Pierce et al., we looked at 13 ranches, 330, and used a more rigorous technique. The first one was, uh, these were more rigorous technique for the analyses. And the first study we found some, we got really excited. Uh, I was really dancing the happy dance. Uh, we found that these are the plot and this is the log of the p values, some very unusual associations at, on chromosome 29, GMR5, uh, a genetic marker for that's associated in other species like spatial memory and other things. We thought, man, that's some really good things. It almost looked like. The heritability, this might be something around heritability of weaning weight, our um, the GMR5 on chromosome 29, spatial locomotion, motivation, all kinds of cool stuff. And then um, six candidate genes accounted for 34% of the phenotypic variation. That's just like the same about, as you would say, for like weaning weight. Um, the heritability is the proportion of phenotypic variation explained by the genotype, and we were excited about that. We did a second study with more animals, more intense stuff. We did find some associations. Uh, definitely, it looks like it's a heritable trait, terrain use is a heritable trait. Um, it's, it's a heritable trait, but it's, we found like 32 uh, quantitative trait tra tra loci, QTLs, 29 putative candidate genes. And these places of these genes were, were related to other processes in cattle like hypoxia, feed efficiency, heat stress, and energy metabolism, which is really getting us excited. The issue with it is, is that we couldn't afford them. Ideally, in genetic studies, you should, you should track loads of animals at one time and get lots of data, it's like thousands of animals. And that's hard to do because GPS cars were expensive, hard to process. And so, and, or you use phenotype and our purebred seed stock herds, typically don't graze really rugged terrain that we're interested in. So we're thinking about, we're hoping to work with Pablo Gregorini. He's got some tracking data and blood data stuff. We're hoping to pull up, do a New Zealand, uh, Western US study, try to put this and figure out some ways to try to hom homogenize and be able to 
com better combine the data from different ranches with different spots. Um, lastly, I'm getting hopefully wrapping up here quickly. Um, virtual fencing is also a precision, um, uh, uh, yeah, precision livestock thing. It's, it works well. There's a lot of promise. So I think some of the only issues are really cost and uh, it's still kind of an issue, but it, for certain things, it may work really well. And it's starting to get looked at. And there's good research and there's lots of promising things for that. I think the biggest issue of it is that for precision livestock management on rangeland is it's not the same. It, it is being done all the time in dairies. Dairies, the cattle come in two or three times a day. There's power. There's cell phone things. It's you've got route. You can have routers. You can have everything. Wi-Fi all over. It works great for real time monitoring in a dairy environment. In large pastures, it is a bear. There's lack of cell service, it's remote, and you got terrain to blockage, it's a big deal. One of the things we think of is that other technologies may help us out, like including drones, where we could have our cow getting a GPS signal, but rather than going to a tower to low raw, maybe we could transfer it up to a drone that periodically transferred it, and then from the drone, you could send to the drone, and then go to the internet from the drone to the internet cloud. So I think there's a lot of potential for that and a lot of, lot of potential and a lot of new technologies to allow real-time tracking to work in mountainous rural areas. So with that, I'll quit and thanks. We're trying to do the whole high-tech thing. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much for that, Derek. Um, yeah, again, it's really interesting. Um, Working within Pablo's lab, we I know there is a student, a former student of Pablo's that has done some work on this and found that as well, that there are heritable um, sort of grazing personalities that sort of mean we could actually start selecting animals to, to graze hill country versus um, lower sort of stock camp areas. And um, so, yeah, that, that's a really interesting space. The first question, I'll just kick it off. I'll, I'll ask a question and I'll let, then I'll let everyone else sort of ask their own questions um, was around how, what is the, the farmer uptake of this sort of technology? You sort of touched on it being quite hard with uh, like connectivity and, and uh, some of the uh, places uh, where you are, it's, it's probably a lot more um, out in the wops, I guess, uh, than, than what we have here in New Zealand. Do you think, uh, but do you think that one of the issues around this sort of uptake is is related to um, cost or or how farmers sort of being able to interpret that information. Like, what are your views on that? It's a lot. At first, it's got to work, right? The first thing has got to work. I mean, there's a lot of promises. A lot of promises made. A lot of good people tried really hard, but it's not easy. But there are some that are. There and then the, the second thing is is there may be other approaches that if we have to put a we could get lots more if we could monitor all of our animals you know in our herd or our flock that would be fantastic but we might not be able to do for that there's a we might be able to just use signal animals and there's still a lot of interest in it if just nothing else but just to find that find the animals i've been tracking animals people always said hey can i buy one of those to go find my cows and find my cows and here and in, in Australia, uh, and probably New Zealand too, is not that easy. I mean, it's just like, where, where are those things? There's a lot of interest in it. The cost is a big deal, but I, I expect the cost would go down. Because they're using the same thing. I mean, the cost for tracking um, trucks, moving stuff around, almost all of them are being used. The price of that stuff is going down. Um, one, the, the Oyster 2 uh, GPS thing is like only 150. It has, it should last a long time and about 150 US dollars for the unit. And a big issue is the subscription for cellular. I think that's gonna be, end up being a bigger issue is the cost of the, of the service. Um, Cirrus has one that's satellite based. So it could probably work almost anywhere. The issue is cost. And I, we don't right know what the cost is, but if it could get down, you know, something like, I think if you get, you get a lot of uptake in it, at least on a big portion of the animals, if you get it down to 10 to $15 per cow per year, I think it'd get a lot of uptake. But, and I don't think that's out of the realm, but first we got to get usable stuff, prove the market, 
There's a lot of entrepreneurs trying to down. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting. Uh, John, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Uh, Derek, probably about 15, 16 years ago, I was out at uh, Red Rock, I think it's Red Rock Canyon Ranch in Lander, Wyoming. It's a nature conservancy site. Bob Budd uh, was there managing the place, if I recall correctly. Yes, and, right. And, and I don't, I was just, you know, I was kind of thinking about the technology aspects, and I'm also thinking about the heritability aspects. Um, at the time, you know, there's a lot of discussion about stream fencing and keeping cows out of wetlands and whatnot. And Bob said, look, it's just cheaper for us, given the mileage uh, of stream, linear stream, it's just cheaper for us to have a cowboy. And he was using the cowboys to modify the animal's behavior. And he was finding some cows just wanted to be those bottom dwelling <laughs> muckrakers or whatever it was he called them. I forget exactly. But one of the interesting points that he made was that they tracked those cattle. And it seemed like the ones that uh, wanted or were, you know, malleable enough, willing enough to, to move up the hill with the cowboys uh, were better performers than those ones that wanted to stay in the bottom. And I think part of that is you move up these slopes and you get a breeze, you have fewer insect and other pressures, you know, you maybe have better forage resources if you're doing a better job of utilizing or that sort of thing. Anyway, that's kind of a long preamble just to say, would you comment on that? What's your experience with any of that, you know, just uh, in terms of the, the performance metrics relative to some of the genetics that you've seen? Right, so we did, we did a couple of studies just on that very thing and in Montana, and then we've done a little bit of follow-up here in New Mexico. Um, we didn't find any relationship between where they graze and their performance. And I think that's, but that means a lot, right? Because it's for sure, everybody expected that, that animals that, that climbed and walked further from water would have lower performance because of it, uh, increased energy commitment to that. But I think what you've mentioned before is exactly what happens. We didn't see it, but I think that I think that kind of equalizes out. The extra energy put in to walk and to climb is made up by better quality forage that they find there. So overall, we didn't we didn't find any any relationships, which means that there's no problem with selecting for that. You could probably simultaneously select for performance and simultaneously select for their grazing and spatial movements at the same time. I would think a lot of of that. Spatial movement, though, would also there would be some um, learning just kind of with, within the herd or from mama or that sort of thing. I'm kind of wondering, you know, at what point can you? Right, and and, and, and for sure you're right. Everything's nature and nurture, right? And um, exactly. But the problem is, is the cool thing about what we were interested in is the training that would would be to take to, to train is there. And if we could if we can identify from like real-time tracking, we can identify cows that climb. We get both, we get genetics and the training from the mom, but the big potential is that you can make the most progress is if you can select from the bull. And that's why we're really hoping to find a genomic thing where we can just get a blood sample and send in and get a genomic um, breeding value from the DNA or from a hair sample, skin sample, whatever it is, send it in and we can send you back a, and rank bulls from some producers, which are more likely to have daughters that are willing to climb and travel. So I think it's just the potential from the bull side is why we wanted to look at the genetics as well. And for sure, herding is a great thing. It's, it's, it's lots of fun, students, everybody in the West US, well, we all wanna be cowboys and it's, it's a ton of fun, but it's expensive. So, so have you looked at any of those French studies like where the, the herders will take dairy cattle or whatever over out lands that uh, we wouldn't normally think about running cows on in this country. I mean, they, they're talking like their Holstein, Holstein Friesians are, are fairly well adapted, but part of it is getting to them when they're at a young age and <laughs> kind of teaching them how to keep their footing on those slopes and that sort of thing. I mean, have, you, do, have they done any genetic work in that environment? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, 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 I'm tempted. I always keep wanting to do that and I look at some of the stuff that like some of the other people here, I, Spain has some really cattle that really climb they have some really outstanding cattle climbing you know in france and switzerland and Ital italian alps there's some real potential on it but i think it's there's there's a lot of potential for it but i think it's 
we need there's so much variation within a cow i think we need to find a, a thing and so the training with it with the herding you can do that we've done a bunch of herding work with you know low stress low stress stockmanship bud william techniques and we can really do it. we've paid, we've gotten cows in some other words to go graze really steep tough areas and you can we were able to do it the french can do it you can do it i don't even think it you just the training the cows need trained but cowboys need trained more and so you can certainly do it. It's just really expensive. Maybe we'd be able to do it with a with virtual fence. I don't know, but I think having more motivated animals that are more adapted to climb will only make it easier and more effective. And both effective probably for herding as well. I can come in. Thank you very much for that, Derek. Very interesting talk. Um, I'm coming out of the arable and the, the cropping sectors and using precision ag there. Um, and you know, stuff like yield maps, we get a lot of data in. And the question is from the growers, what am I supposed to do with this? And I was looking at your raw GPS traces. To me, lots of data, but it's kind of the, 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 the farmers, the, um, the graziers, what they want to know is when a cow's in trouble or when an animal's in trouble or when they need to do something. And so you were talking about, you know, AI analysis of the data and stuff. So where's that at? You know, essentially the farmer only gets to, to be told when there's a problem that he can go and act on. Oh, the, the great question, and, and and I just didn't get a chance to talk about it enough. You really, it's got to be on that end, and there's two things that you got to do a bunch of AI work to do that. We're we're trying hard to work on that here, and um, trying to find out to develop algorithms to so that you could have something that would just have a very simple something just text like cow seventy five maybe calving or maybe ill and she's located here and then have them go look at it. So it's, it's, it's a big deal. A second thing is edge computing. We may be, maybe do some of that processing on the animal to reduce the amount of material that is, needs to be transmitted. Her dog does that already so that they can cut down a number of data in each transmission. So it's like pr processing on the tag or processing on the collar is really an important thing because you, the battery commit issue is such a big deal with the transmission part. So you're, you're absolutely right. I just don't, 15 minutes didn't give you enough time to tell all my stories. <laughs> just, just, uh, just thinking about that, you know, if you've got the hand, cow in the trouble on the top of the hill or something like that, you send somebody out to do it. I was just thinking there's been quite a bit of interest over here in using drones instead of um, sheepdog. Um, you know, so on our sheep and things like that. And I think there's some studies been showing the the animals are far less stressed by being moved with a drone, which kind of was surprising considering the dreadful noise some of them make. I mean, what, what's the potential then for actually having UAVs? You're getting a signal, there's a cow way up the back that might be in trouble and actually then start to send, right, let's send a UAV up the back here to go and see what's going on and then send a person in if, if you need some, you know, the boots on the ground. I think there's a lot of potential for that. There's even, there's even uh, uh, some nice guys out of Israel trying to do stuff to have autonomous drones to herd, herd livestock. So I think there's a, drones have a lot of potential and have them go check on it. Um, I think a drone may be able to do it, but our, in some of our systems, our only real limitation probably is we just got to keep, make sure we can afford batteries big enough to move those, move, get that drone out, way out to go take, take a look at it and hopefully not Animals and not tree cover wouldn't be an issue. Tree or shrub covers could be an issue with that very same thing. Uh, so one one thing I did want to ask as well um, was I've heard a lot of research in, in cattle behaviour and sort of grazing personalities in cattle. But do you think this is something that's transferable to other species, particularly say more social socially bound sort of species like, for instance, deer or even sheep? I guess. Sure. I I mean this. On with sheep, I mean, depends on what question is. Certainly, there's a lot of potential to use the, the remote monitoring, precision livestock management for sheep, deer. It'll work with all of it. Um, in the U.S., there's not as much interest in using the trying to find climbers with sheep because we typically would have a herder with our sheep in our real rugged environments, and so we that's up to the herder. In, with sheep, the big issue is is the biggest potential is with predation. Um, coyotes and wolves are tough on them. So, um, but there's a lot of potential for that. With sheep, sheep are really have, have, have done really well. 
it wasn't for predation and stuff, they'd probably be grazing a lot more of the rugged terrain that we have in the Western US. Yeah, that's um, really interesting. Uh, in the last five minutes, I just sort of wanted to make a comment and then perhaps we could sort of discuss because it sort of, I sort of found that one of the themes uh, that kind of emerged from this sort of session was around uh, the individual variation that we find in, in cattle, uh, not only in uh, Chittagong cattle, but, but also in the US uh, where you are, Derek. And, and one of the things that I sort of found throughout my research as well uh, looking at sort of rumen pH and fermentation and grazing behavior of dairy cows and individual animals is that um, some of the, the diseases and things such, such as uh, ruminal acidosis and, um, and stuff is actually related to individual variation. And with the, the rise of the emerging technologies, um, GPS and, and such, uh, we're starting to notice more of the individual characteristics and I guess I just wanted to, to comment or to ask and find out what you guys sort of think about how um, how we're going to, how this is going to drive sort of how we develop herds and, and how we how we can use this technology I guess to to sort of develop different herds for different landscapes and different purposes and, and whether you guys have noticed sort of something uh, similar to that in your fields. I mean, I think I just I just said it, it, there's a huge amount of variation, and and our, the only reason we haven't don't notice is we haven't spent enough time with the animals, and this remote sensing, the remote monitoring of it makes it so you can, and so um, I think that I think it's got a great opportunity, and plus the advancement in genomics will allow us to do a lot more as well. Those two technologies are happening at the same time, and really going to be able to maybe make design like this quote, quote unquote designer cows and designer things but the technology is close just not quite there yet especially on a on determining the phenotype we've got a little more work to do it's just man they, it, it could happen it's just cost and reliability my thoughts Cameron what are your thoughts on using this sort of technology in the red chittagong Kettle. Um, I'm just sitting back and, and listening here, I agree, uh, with everything, the, the limitations. I see genetics, genomics as being far, I mean, the, basically our geneticists are looking for phenotypes to run their geno genomic analysis across. So I, that's what I see. <clears throat> I see the, the cost, as Derek said, I see the cost of getting a great phenotype, or getting, a co getting the cost down to reveal the diversity because you know a lot of people talk about sentinel animals but you know given the diversity the that exists they, they've got a role to play but maybe not what what was once thought around you know reducing costs of monitoring so uh, you know co cost and and getting great phenotypes is the is the lack here not the genetic side um but i think we're there it's on the i think we're on the really on the cusp of this you know and but I think, yeah, the maybe maybe not so much, and maybe the maybe where we could go with this is that you know all the the developing countries cattle, you know, <clears throat> maybe the cost of phenotyping comes down so much that you know the step change that can happen in terms of those developing countries could be huge with these rapid advances in in phenotyping. It could actually enable them to start directly, if you like, step change in terms of management as well. Um, you know, chain, but it's all to do with, and this is iterator as well around that. You know, how do you condense that, all that data into an action? And, and that's, you know, the data really isn't the really um, limiting thing now. It's it's the smarts to get that data into, a, once it's collected in a cheap way, getting that into an action is the, is, is the limit step. Yeah, that's definitely, it's something we sort of talked about in the previous workshops as well, is that with the rise of data, you know, there's not only the problem of, uh, putting it in a form that's inter that farmers can interpret, but also um, as scientists having the opportunity to actually interpret and make something meaningful of that data as well. Um, and one last question I guess I have, uh, we've got a couple of minutes, uh, was around, I know one of the photos you showed before Derek was of uh, sort of a satellite image and, and potential for using GPS to, to um, estimate or predict uh, herbage and, and um, when, you know, telling farmers when to graze and, and stuff. And I guess uh, in New Zealand, we've sort of got um, some 
that sort of technology is starting to emerge for predicting sort of herbage mass using satellite. And I just wondered um, whether you've got something similar going on over there or whether that, no, that's I, an option for, for that. It, it's, it, it's an it, for sure it's an option. It's just in, in New Zealand, you guys, you guys get rain, which is kind of cool. So it's you get a lot more growth. I think that, I think there's more things that the problem we have is a lot of dry forage. And so I, we were just uh, like trying to get more value out of our on animal sensors. And so if we could use that, we get more value out of it. We could get detection for disease, health, calving, lambing, and maybe some ideas about how they're foraging both and protecting riparian areas, but also that the social interactions, we might be able to get more out of it to get that done and get more value of it. And so there's a, a lot of interest, there's some interest in, in social interactions and is all the idea is try to get the most value though on things. There's still loads of things directly from satellite imagery and probably from drones better yet um, to be able to do some mapping. And in our case, we'll, I think it's, it's, it's cases of being able to use that to, to map vegetation are just not quite as good once the forage is dry. So then you can't use like NDVI and SDVI related things. You might be able to still do it with uh, LIDAR or something as well. That's another potential idea. LIDAR might be another way to measure just the stubble height. We just have with shrubs and low productivity and dry weather, it makes it a little trickier. So we're thinking, that's what we're trying to think about. Maybe we can get some value out of on animal sensors as well. Mm -hmm.